Good morning and happy Easter. Easter. We're glad that you're here with us this morning. You picked the perfect day to be here and uh, to be able to celebrate. You know, we do this worship on Sunday, and the Christian church has worshiped on Sunday for now millennia. And here's why. Because Sunday is Resurrection Day. We talk about the Sabbath, but yesterday was the Sabbath. It says in scripture, on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb and Jesus was raised from the dead. So every Sunday is Resurrection Day, and this is Resurrection Sunday. So you picked the perfect time to be here and to be able to worship. So let's stand together, join our voices, join our hearts as we worship our risen Savior. Take me out. 
God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave.
this day, while we emphasize the resurrection and we emphasize the power over death, the power over darkness, this day resonates in every single day of our lives. We would not be able to live victoriously each and every single day if not for this day. So as we celebrate Easter, as we continue to worship him, may your thankfulness of his sacrifice continue to ring through every single day this week and the next week and the next week because he is risen. Great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the dark, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my living hope and hallelujah praise the one who set me free
day, yeah, in a world looking for hope, desperate for hope, today is the day of hope. Today is the day that all the great reversals happen. Death has lost its grip, has no threat over us. Sin no longer has a claim on us. He's broken every chain. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Amen. So there are a lot of people in here, so you have a lot of work ahead of you because we're greeting right now. And if you're an introvert, I just apologize beforehand. <laughs> so I know this drives you nuts, but we want to shake your hand. And I want to offer you the chance to, here's what you could say. For centuries on Resurrection Day, Christians have said, Christ is risen, and the response is, he is risen indeed. So if you can't think of anything else to say, you can say to somebody, Christ is risen, and then they'll know what to say back to you. Uh, let's turn and greet people. But before you do that, I just want to say I'm so sorry, ladies, for the bathroom mess. Um, it was not our will, but God's. Um, <laughs> so this bathroom that's out of commission is like not useful, and I'm so sorry. But there's two bathrooms right around this corner. So if you sneak off, yes, we'll know where you're going, but that's where you can go. Now you can greet each other, please. <laughs> Nice job. Good job, everybody. I hope everybody got a nice, warm greeting on this Resurrection Day. I'm just impressed you're all here, you know, in view of this is spring break, and it's one of the, you know, 12 sunny days we'll get in spring. So thank you for being here. And if you're visiting with us, we are especially grateful that you're here. If you could sign the communication card that's in the pew right in front of you, let us know that you're here, that how we can be praying for you. Um, if you're close in the neighborhood and we can do something for you, we'd love to know that. So that's what those connection cards are for, is to just you to connect with us, us to connect with you, and, and to be able to share life with you. So... Please don't hesitate to do that. We won't bother you. We just want to know you're here and how we can pray for you. So the big question today is, why are you here? Why are you here? I think some of us are here because we love Jesus and we're committed to him. And we value a chance to worship like this. That was a great time of worship. He's a worthy savior. And so... We're here for that, and it fills us up, it fills our hearts, it fills our souls. It's Easter Sunday. Some of you are here because it's Sunday, and it's your duty. You don't know where else to be on Sunday. You would feel weird if you weren't here. Can I get an amen? amen. Yeah. So you're here, but maybe it's for love, maybe it's just because you know you're supposed to be here. It's kind of a duty. It could be that you're here because uh, someone who loves you more than you wish they did <laughs> guilted you into being here today and you're like, I hope this doesn't take long right now, <laughs> which so far it's not going very well for you. <laughs> and I hope it doesn't, I hope you don't feel guilty. I hope, and I hope you don't feel like, oh man, I just have to be here. I hope by the end of this time, you're asking yourself why you're here and you have a a motivating love in your heart for why you're here and who loves you enough to get you here. Because <clears throat> that's, that's good. My suspicion is some of you are here because you just felt like you should be in a place like this on a day like today. Something's been happening in your heart. 
some stirring, some lights coming on, some questions being asked or answered, but something's happening in your heart and you're, you're here today because you feel like God is reaching for you, but you're just not sure how to reach back. And as we go through our time this morning, I, I'm hoping that some of how to reach back is revealed to you in this time. You know, there's a story that goes with today, and it's told through the eyes of three women in every gospel. Every gospel, there are these three women who come to the tomb site on Sunday morning, first day of the week after Passover is finished and <clears throat> the, um, the night of, of um, Sabbath is, is ended into the day, and it's their first chance to come and see the grave. It's their first chance to get there. And these three women have stories. They don't just show up here in scripture. They're not three strangers. But I want to take just a few minutes this morning and look at why each of them were there. Why did they show up? Why did they come? What was important to them about being there? And what can we kind of learn from their lives and, and their lessons? Maybe answering the question a little bit for us why we showed up today. So here's how the story goes. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? But when they got there, they looked up and they saw that the stone which is very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed, you would be too. And as angels are prone to do, he says, don't be alarmed, I'm an angel. Don't be alarmed, don't be afraid, don't be terrified. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told you, trembling and bewildered, no matter what the angel said. The women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were scared to death. Now that's Mark's account of the way this morning went. But I start there because he named these three women for us. And the first in our list for this morning is Salome. And why she was there. Why did she get up early? Why was it important to her? Why did she go get the spices? Why would she take a risk like this? Remember, the tomb was under Roman guard. Why would she take a risk like this and go early in the morning to do something that they didn't have time to do on Friday night? There wasn't time before the sunset to properly prepare Jesus' body for burial. And so they're back here on Sunday morning trying to take care of it. Well, we meet her family early in Jesus' career. In fact, after he had relocated from Nazareth where he grew up and he came out to the Galilee, and that's what they call a region around the Sea of Galilee, we meet John and James and Zebedee and Salome. And here's the passage. Going on from there, where Jesus is recruiting, he saw two other brothers, because he just recruited Peter and his brother. Two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John. And they were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing for their nets. And Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. So these are some of the very first followers of Jesus. They've left everything to go with him. And they follow Jesus. And as we read through the Gospels, they become some of his very, very closest friends. Jesus had an inner circle of James and John, these two brothers, and Peter. And this little threesome, this little trio was with him at, at the very most important parts and moments of Jesus' life. But it wasn't just these two. It was their families. So it wasn't just the sons. We read a little further in Mark 15. Some women were watching from a distance, and this is they're watching the crucifixion from a distance, partly because of the crowd, partly because it's dangerous, partly because it's super gross, and just horrifyingly gross. 
And so they're watching from a distance, probably through the fingers in front of their faces. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed Jesus and cared for his needs, and many other women who, uh, who had come up with him to Jerusalem were there also in this group of women watching from a distance. The reason Salome is there is Jesus had changed the lives of her boys. She had watched them turn from rough, gruff fishermen into real men, secure, solid in who they were, following this teacher who was teaching them the ways of wisdom, the ways to live life out of love and grace and mercy and rightness. I mean, that's every mother's prayer, right? <laughs> that their children will grow up and be happy and be fulfilled and be good people, learn to love, learn generosity. What better teacher could Salome's two sons, which were nicknamed the sons of thunder, I don't know what that means, but it doesn't sound good. It sounds like frat, a frat room or something, you know, but that these two boys grew up under Jesus' teaching. In fact, they were so changed that she dared something greatly for them. In our next passage, here's the surprise. The mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor for him, from him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit on your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. Oh, this is a big ask. And Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, all three of them answered. And Jesus said, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right hand or left is not for me to grant. These places to belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. In other words, Jesus is not making the sitting arrangement. God the Father is making the arrangement. And it's something Jesus cannot give them. But it's so beautiful that he affirms for them, you are living this Jesus life with me and you are drinking the cup. If anybody was worthy, it's probably you. I'm just not in charge of seating. Many of us have seen our loved ones change by Jesus. People that we've prayed for and cared for. And maybe just like Salome went to the tomb on resurrection morning because of everything Jesus had done for her sons and her family and for her own life. She was there out of that kind of love and devotion. She was not expecting a miracle on resurrection morning. She was, her life was changed completely. It's already miraculous. And then she comes and finds the miracle of resurrection. The other woman who went was Mary, mother of James, the lesser, or the little, or, or the not so great, which is a terrible name. Hey, not so great, get over here, you know. Um, but there's a reason that he's named this, and I'll give you a little backstory here. So this Mary is actually Mary, the mother of Jesus' sister. You're like, wait, what? Why are they both named Mary? Well, it was a very common Jewish name. And it was probably in a line of names. Each woman was given like not just a name, but several names. And it's derived from Moses' wonderful sister, Miriam, who sang the great praise of God when they were saved from the Egyptian army following them through the Red Sea thousands of years before this. So it's one of those beautiful names that was just carried forward. So she's called Mary, the son of James the Lesser because Jesus also had a brother named James. And he was born first. So he was literally, from the time he was little, James the Elder, or Big James. And the other Mary had a James, which is also a very famous Jewish name. And he was little James. So don't think that he's James the marginalized. Don't pray for justice for James. He's okay. It's not that he's smaller. He's just younger. And as they grow up and go through history, literally Jesus' brother James becomes the head of the church. And his cousin James becomes one of the great followers of the church, but they're still called Big James and Little James, even when they're old guys, because of the family tie. And it was a beautiful tie. 
I mean, it started early when <clears throat> Mary, well, both Marys were newlyweds, and they were kind of figuring out married life together and how to live with these men, and probably started their families pretty close, and then had to kind of share taking care of each other's kids and watching out for each other and encouraging each other on those days. You know, preschool moms, you know, those days. They just needed each other, and so there they are in Nazareth, and they, and they have become close friends through all of life, and they just need each other. They just lean each other, these two sisters, both named Mary. And now, Mary, the sister, Jesus' aunt, has watched him grow up, has watched him learn who he is, that he is the promised one, the Messiah. He is not just the son of Joseph and Mary. He is the son of God. And now, Mary needs to support her sister in a whole new way. Now she needs to help her bear the burden that she is the mother of the Messiah. And what a great burden that was. In fact, it was, it was included <clears throat> when, Jesus was, um, when Jesus was committed at the temple. Eight days after he was born, he was taken to the temple. And there he was dedicated. And one of the priests named Simeon took the, the baby in the dedication. And he said many important things over it. And I skipped a few slides here back there, but we're at Luke 2, 34 and 35. And this is what Simeon says. This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken again so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword, Mary, will pierce your own soul too. And I'm sure when Mary heard this and Joseph went, oh no, honey. And they took their baby back and they, again, you know, escaped because of Herod and then they came back and moved back into Nazareth. And I'm sure Mary, Jesus' mother, was telling her sister and Simeon said that Jesus' whole life is gonna pierce my own heart. I can just picture Mary, her sister, saying, I'll be there, I'm, for, I'm here for you. And now this crucial moment with Jesus on the cross and Mary Magdalene losing strength as she watches her son lose his breath. And she understands this piercing of her heart. And so does her sister. Her sister feels it with her and bears the burden with her. There's a part of me that thinks that the reason Mary the mother of James, the, l the lesser, is going to the garden grave on Easter morning is because her sister just couldn't bear to see her dead son. They knew they had to go. They knew this had to be done. But how could Mary, the mother of Jesus, bear to see his dead body lying there in the crypt? Too much. And so his Aunt Mary said, let me go. So why is she there? on Easter morning because of her love for her sister and her love for Jesus, of course. But she had watched Mary's love for Jesus grow over these years and she'd watched through the tragedy over these days and now she knows that the best thing she could do out of her love for her sister and her sister's love for her son is take her place and go. Some of us come to resurrection mourning kind of broken inside. And we've felt the suffering, we've felt that piercing of our own hearts in so many ways. And we come to a tomb expecting death and degradation and threat, maybe heavy stones that need to be rolled, but we show up anyway, even though it hurts to be there. The last Mary is probably the best, most touching story in all the New Testament. This is Mary of Magdala, or Mary Magdalene. And no one's story with Jesus is more compelling than this third woman who comes to the grave on, on Easter morning. She's called Mary Magdalene because she's from a little village called Magdala, which is about six miles around the lake from Capernaum, where Jesus had kind of set up his ministry, HQ Jesus was in Capernaum. And when it says they traveled through towns and villages, it means he just went around the shoreline to all these little fishing villages 
and Magdala was one of them. And this is Mary from Magdalene. And he knows her. They have a little bit of a history, not a Dan Brown history, not a conspiracy history. They were never married. They never dated. I'll read the history. Here it is in Luke 8. After this, Jesus traveled from town to town and village to village, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, was there. Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their means. That's how Jesus met Mary. She came to him oppressed, suffering, terrorized. And he released her from it out of love and grace and mercy. By his divine power, she was healed and became a follower of Jesus like so many others. And I love that Luke mentions that there are a lot of women. We just don't name them. He didn't even name the 12. He just said the 12, the famous 12. He didn't name the 30. You know, who cooks for 12 men? 30 women. You know, they're following Jesus around, but they need help everywhere. I mean, somebody's got to ask for directions and, you know. So these women, like, if we leave them alone, this is never going to work. We have to go with them and, and take care of them. But they were, these women were as committed and grateful and devoted as any of the 12 men. They're such an important part of Jesus' story that this last part of his story is told through the eyes of these three women and their experience. He revealed himself first to them. In fact, John's telling of the resurrection story is very specific as to Jesus' interaction with Mary of Magdala. And here's how it goes. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated there where Jesus' body had been, and one at the head and the other at the feet. And they asked her, what? woman, what? why are you crying? And they're like, isn't it obvious they've taken my Lord away? And I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? And thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I'll get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary, in a way that caught her attention, she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher, rabbi. And Jesus said, don't hold me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. One of the most dramatic and definitive moments in Jesus' passion is this moment with Mary. Is this first post-resurrection revelation. And you know, history is full of where Jesus was between when he rose and when he showed up in the garden. Did he go to hell and open the gates and release all the captives and lead them to heaven? Did he go and conquer Satan? You know, what all happened in that time? All I know is he showed up in the garden and met Mary Magdalene. Not because of any romantic connection, not because she's a woman at all, but because she was completely lost before she knew Jesus. She was terrorized with these demons and she was set free. And then her heart was broken watching her savior terrorized on the cross. So she comes and all she can do is honor his passing. At this late date, they have to unwrap the body, treat the body, rewrap it, I mean, it's a mess but she's there anyway and finds that she runs into the resurrected Christ, Jesus the living King. He now stands in front of her breathing and talking, saying, don't hold on to me, I gotta go. <laughs> See, most of us come to the empty tomb on a resurrection day like today because of our love for Jesus or maybe our curiosity about Jesus. Maybe we know it's Easter, this is where we're supposed to go before we eat ham and collect Easter eggs. Just part of the day. Some of us, we're here because we know God's at work. 
Maybe we come like these women did, kind of nervous. What are we gonna find? Who's gonna roll this stone in my heart out of the way? I don't think Jesus can get out or get in. Some of us here today know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and we worship him, and we wouldn't miss a resurrection day to say thank you for your death and resurrection. Thank you for saving me. Like we sang over and over, beautiful. Some of us are here because <clears throat> last time we were here was Christmas, and now it's Easter, and so we're here. But I want you to understand that even if you're one of those folks like these women who watched the crucifixion from a long way off, and you've been looking at Jesus from a distance, and you've been wondering what it's like if you got close to Jesus, what he would be like. What life would be like if you got close enough to him to have a personal relationship with him. How much would it change your life? Look at these women whose lives are radically altered because of God's love expressed in Jesus Christ. And some of you still wonder if there was a really a guy named Jesus and if this whole thing actually took place or is it just a big myth that a bunch of us use to you know, hold power over other people? Well, if there's anything a resurrection story says, it says that power is not to be held over people but to support people. Look what Jesus did when he came. He didn't come pounding out and break the stone and make a big splash and kill all the Roman soldiers and come running into the temple and said, I told you I was a son of God. He just quietly let three women know that he wasn't dead anymore. Massive power. Guided by love and humility. Resurrection power aimed at forgiving broken hearts. Life, true life that is life. He's the life giver to people who are surrounded by death and are looking for life. Remember what the angel said? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. He's risen. At the close of our time today, we're gonna to have a baptism. And that baptism is something people have been doing in following Jesus Christ literally for millennia. And it is a sign, it's a beautiful sign that God has given to us, the church, to make our public confession that we are followers of Jesus. And it's beautiful on Resurrection Day because the way that we do baptism, we literally use water like it's ground and people go under the water as they're dead to their life without Jesus and then are raised back up to a Jesus life. So if you're here today and you've been, God's been working in your life and you know he's been working in your life and this is exactly where you needed to be and this is exactly what you needed to hear, Jesus is calling for you. He died for you. More importantly, he raised for you. And now he's calling you to himself. That great power is not something he wants to use to subjugate you. He wants to lift you up. He wants to offer you transformation. Life instead of death. Joy instead of sadness. Hope instead of fear. That's the Jesus we recognize today. So we're going to have a little more time of worship and and a couple other things are gonna happen, but you're not leaving out these doors. I don't care where you parked. <laughs> All 400 of us are gonna fit in the lobby. So you're gonna go out this way, or you can go out this way. And we're gonna surround that baptismal font. And if God is calling you today, and you wanna heed his voice today, you could be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ today. I'll already be wet. So you can just come into the pool with me. Let's pray. On the first day of the week, every very early in the morning, 
The women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wandering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their, in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. <clears throat> but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And then they remembered his words. Lord, we remember your words today. He is risen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. We're uh, very privileged to have you all. It's been um, a great service so far, but remember, it's not over yet. Our ushers are going to get ready. We're going to move into a time of offering. And one thing I was noticing as I was, I, I made those slides this week. They looked great, didn't they? But one thing I noticed is that what has Jesus done for me could be a question, or what Jesus has done for me can be an answer. So as we leave this morning, maybe you're kind of, you can live in both spots. Did you know that? <laughs> it's good to remind yourself, Lord, what have you done for me? Not what have you done for me lately. That's kind of how we live our lives a lot of times. And allow that to just permeate your life, permeate your soul, permeate who you are and say, this is what I know he's done for me. So let's enjoy that this morning. One of the other things that we get to do is we get to pray for our missionaries every week that we support. In the, in the bulletin, it has a little blurb about the Schindlers. You can read that. They serve with crew uh, in the Northwest region. So read about them. Take the bulletin home and pray for them this week. They would probably love that. And I'm sure they could even feel your prayers as you do that. And then also another thing we'd like to do is highlight a, one of our ministries here. And how many of you had coffee this morning? All right, well, thank the cafe for being... Caffeinated, amen, yeah. It's, you know, it's, it makes life a little, it's easier to connect, I think, when we're caffeinated, amen. It's easier to connect and, and just have conversation. And it's not just about the coffee, it's about the environment that it creates. And we want to create a place where you feel welcome, you feel at home, where you can have conversation. And so thank you, cafe team, hospitality team, period, people at the doors greeting. But thank you, cafe team, for uh, providing for uh, that every week. So we're going to pray for uh, Diane and Doug, uh, Doug Schindler, and we're going to uh, pray for the cafe team this morning. And then during the song, we'll pr pl pass the offering plate. Uh, the other thing also, if you're here, there's a connection card in front. If you are a guest, we'd love for you to fill that out. We won't harass you. If you're a Mountain Park person, just remember you can put testimonies and prayer requests on there. And if you're a guest, you can put both on there as well. Uh, there's no limit to what you can put on the connection card. Just put that on there, and you can either drop that on the, in the plate or leave that in your, on your chair when you leave. So let's pray. Jesus Christ, we just thank you that you came across all worlds to rescue us, that you saw humanity suffering under the weight of sin, that you saw us in danger of lapsing into nothingness, and your creation was spoiled and marred and, and ruined, and you came to save us and give us life. You came to do that which we could not do on our own, not out of anger, not out of uh, any kind of uh, rage, but out of love, you came to rescue us, to restore us to relationship with you. There's nothing to fear. There's no longer fear that the enemy has been eradicated. Any lie of distance and delay that, we, that you're far off, that's, that's all eradicated on the cross. That you have come near. You are God with us. You are closer than the air we breathe and nearer than our skin. And we thank you for that this morning. We thank you for the Schindler's Lord, bless their ministry, bless their life on this Resurrection Sunday. I thank you for our wonderful, holy uh, coffee fans, I mean coffee makers for us, our hospitality team, that, our cafe team that makes coffee for us every week. Bless them, bless their hands, and bless this offering. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.
takes away the sins of all. Forgiveness flows from hands and feet as violence meets the Prince of Peace. Behold the King, light of the world, lamb that was slain, lion who rose, mighty to save, the fullness of God won't be kept in a grave, darkness your hour is over. Behold, the love is dying clear. Behold, the grace of Calvary, that rugged cross soon to be. The emblem of a risen King. Behold. Light of the world, Lamb that was slain, Lion who rose, mighty to save. The fullness of God won't be kept in a grave. The darkness, your hour is over. Light of the world. Was slain, lion who rose, mighty to save. The fullness of God won't be kept in a grave. Darkness, your hour is over. you down cause there's nobody in the grave now one head gets to wear that crown cause there's nobody in the grave now no enemy can hold you down cause there's nobody in the grave now one head gets to wear that crown cause there's nobody in the grave now no enemy can hold you down Cause there's nobody in the grave now One head gets to wear that crown Cause there's nobody in the grave now No enemy can hold you down Cause there's nobody in the grave now One head gets to wear that crown Cause there's nobody in the grave now Light of the world Lamb that was slain Lion who rose, mighty to save. The fullness of God won't be kept in a grave. Darkness, your hour is over. Light of the world, lamb that was slain. Lion who rose, mighty to save. The fullness of God won't be kept in a grave. Darkness, your hour is over. Why don't you stand with me? I'm going to play a, pray a, pray a benediction over you, but that's to dismiss you to the 
baptism, not to run away to Easter Sunday yet. I mean, to Sunday lunch yet. Remember, you can go that way down the hall and follow your way and go out that way, or you can go through these doors right here, which we'll have open in a moment. But let me pray a blessing over you. Thank you so much for being here. May the Lord Jesus Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness. May he protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you guys. You're dismissed that way.